Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, let me know if you can hear me all right or if I need to be a bit louder. <clears throat> I can increase the volume slightly. I don't know how much, but we can see how much. <laughs> um, anyway, let me say hello to some people, and I'll explain what's going to happen on this live stream today. Um, so, hello, uh, Mary. Uh, I'll, I'll just call you Mary Patina. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name. But hello, Evan, and hello, uh, Rail Fan. Let's see, Thomas is here. Eric, how are you? Hello, Taylor. Hello, A Fox. Hello, Core Contingency. All right, so everybody, uh, I know originally what I had planned. Um, everyone says they can hear me fine. Just be a tad bit louder. I can do that. Let's see here. I have some new equipment, which should help with that. Bring that down one notch. Okay, so um, I know that originally today we had planned a live stream called um, Queen Mary Tech 101, uh, The Boilers. And unfortunately, uh, so my co-host Steve, I usually have him on here to kind of give you guys a bit of a history lesson. And in that particular live stream, it was going to be a little bit different than what we usually do for Queen Mary's Lost Places, because instead he was also going to be explaining how the propulsion system of the Queen Mary works. And while I have a, a very basic understanding of it, and I pretty much could explain it to you, he could go into further detail on that. And that's exactly what he had planned to do. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, he, he had to gather his research and his information. And a week wasn't long enough to do that. And so, you know, and then he also got really busy this weekend. So, you know, we had to postpone it till next weekend. Um, but yeah, so that live stream is still happening, but it'll happen next weekend. And so today to make up for it, I'm going to be doing a Q and a today, but, um, along the way, while you guys have your questions and things, I will be kind of pointing out some interesting things about the Queen Mary. And by all means, if you have questions about the ship, ask them, we'll see if I can answer them. I also have, uh, some books near me in case I need to reference some books, um, and uh, just don't ask when the Queen Mary will reopen because the answer is still fall. Uh, the city has not released an official reopening date yet. They just said fall. So we'll see. Um, all right, so let's get into this. So let me open this. So um, I have here a, a cutaway of the Queen Mary as she appeared in 1936. And one of the first things I kind of wanted to point out to you guys was um, how... There's a lot of people that think today that they cut out so much of the Queen Mary. And I'll kind of explain some things here. So in the 1970s, when they were, I would say 1969, 1970, 1971, those three years, was when they were converting the ship into a hotel and convention center. And basically, in order to install this big museum that they wanted to put, they had this idea... And in fact, let me see if I have a picture of, well, I don't want to use that, that file because that file I'll need in just a second. Um, oh, come on. Uh, so what I'm going to open up is I have a diagram somewhere of just how they wanted to lay out the museum originally in the 1970s. And before doing the live stream, I didn't think to to find and open that diagram for you guys. Otherwise, I could just illustrate it here. But, you know, it's it's better if I show you guys the actual thing. Um, but basically, they wanted to use all the boiler rooms, which is everything forward here. Also, the turbo generator rooms to create a space for a massive museum of the sea is what they called it. And... Um, in fact, I could show you guys something right now if I can't find the diagram. And we'll just, yeah, I don't, I, I'll look for it as I show you guys the video. Um, okay, so it would be in, uh, hmm. course 
Already things are going wrong. I don't remember where I put that video. It would have to be on this page. Just scrolling, scrolling. I have so much images and video of the ship that it's kind of hard to keep track of. It should be on this page. Okay, well, it's not. All right, well, anyway, I'm just gonna illustrate using this thing for you because I cannot find the image or the video I wanted to show you guys. But the Museum of the Sea was gonna go all the way from the, this is the, the water softening plant right here, just in front of boiler room one. So it's gonna go from here, stretch all the way through the ship, all the way to the forward engine room. There were two engine rooms, the forward and aft engine rooms, and then the forward engine room was the one that was gonna be cut out as well. So it's gonna be all of that. They were gonna leave the aft engine room simply because they didn't really know what they were gonna do with the aft engine room. And they thought, well, you know what, why don't we just leave it behind and we'll kind of create like a little tour where people can walk through it on their own pace. Now you might be wondering, why in the world would they remove all of these things. And, you know, you'd think like it would be a great thing to show for tours, right? Well, the thing was, was back then, people didn't always think of preservation the way that we think of it today. When we think we're gonna preserve a building or a ship or a structure, we think we're going to preserve all of it as best we can so we can show people how everything operated. Well, back then, the idea was just, and this wasn't just Long Beach, this was just the world in general. Their idea was, well, the ship is here. That's preserved. That, that, that was essentially it. They're like, well, it's still here. <laughs> so, th so the fact that they're modifying it really didn't, you know, bother them. And they also thought the other thing too was they thought, well, why would anybody want to see all of this? Why would anybody want to see these boilers and these turbo generator rooms? They're like, it's nasty, it's disgusting, it's dirty. People come here to see the nice, fancy rooms and, and first-class areas. They don't come here to see this. Well, they were wrong because eventually the museum that they, that they built, which they removed all these rooms in this part of the ship, the bulkheads are still there, but they removed everything inside the rooms. And what ended up happening was the museum that they built, the Cousteau Museum, a museum of the seas, uh, really only occupied the space right here. That was about it. There really wasn't, and there might have been some in this boiler room here, but that was just about it. There was nothing else. And no, yeah, yeah, it only went to these these three rooms here. But um, there really wasn't much else to, you know, they, they didn't have enough money to finish the entire museum as they had originally planned it. And I wish I had that diagram here to show you guys. I don't know what in the world I did with it is this can't be it. Is this it? Uh, this is kind of what they eventually did. So you can see they combined three rooms here to make the Queen Mary Maritime Museum, but that's not the diagram. Um, anyway, and it, what ended up happening was they opened up the aft section, which included walking through the aft uh, the aft engine room, the shaft alley, which was for the propellers, and then if you went up a few floors, you could go to the steering room, which is where they is where they uh, steered the rudder of the ship. And so it ended up being the most popular tour on the entire ship was these engine spaces. They realized then that they made a huge mistake. But a lot of people wonder, they, they think, well, you know, they cut out so much of the ship that the ship is structurally unstable. And that's something I wanted to address, is it's not structurally unstable. You see, if you think about it, these boilers are not structural things. They don't hold the ship up. They're just boilers. They just sit there. And so, you know, they have no structural attachment whatsoever to the ship and the bulkheads are all still there and yes they did cut holes in the bulkheads to allow for walkways but they didn't cut out any of the um of the structural steel and i'll even show you my boiler room walkthrough this is a good one let me make sure it's muted there we go and let me downsize it so you guys can actually see well, I'll pause it first. Come on. Oh, 
There we go. Jeez, that took forever. Okay, so we're walking through the boiler rooms, and you can see they've ripped out a lot of the boilers and machinery that was all just sitting here. Um, they would have risen all the way up to the top. In fact, these you can kind of see there's some beams that cross over. This was where the the smoke uptakes went so the exhaust that came out of the boilers would go up through all the levels up through the funnels of the ship and so they actually decked over those areas um, in, in order to increase the, the square footage that they had to use for the hotel and engineering of the ship and so you can actually see you can see the original bulkhead and then there's a big opening cut into it you can even see that the room beyond it it's a massive uh, hole in the ship. And so people think, oh my gosh, there's that big hole. Now that just structurally damages the ship. Well, it's not really because if you look here, you can actually see one of the, I forget, that's not a girder. That's a, um, a support stanchion for a lack of better words. Just trying to be fast with my explanation here. Um, but there's a structural support here but everything to the side of it is just steel plates. It's just dead weight that basically blocks, originally was designed to block water from being able to go from one boiler room to the other. That's what we call a watertight bulkhead. Um, so while the room isn't watertight because of that, it's not structurally unsound. They didn't cut through you know, these major steel things without actually reinforcing it, rebracing it. And my video doesn't show very well the rebracing that they did. Um, but what I can do is, see, so you can see the structural bracing, and then there was the big one there. Um, but what I can do is I have, some, I have pulled up some photos of this area over here. And so when you walk into the Museum of the Sea, um, or I'm sorry, when you walk into the Queen Mary's engine room lobby, exhibit i'll even i'll even show you guys the entrance to that so you walk in on d deck and you come in and you see this massive room now this massive room didn't originally exist there were two different levels here everything from this black ceiling down to this floor level here there were two decks and the one up here was c deck and the one down here was d deck and so in order to create this space, they cut out a lot of C deck going forward. And so people think, oh no, that destroyed the structural integrity of the ship. But no, look at these brand new 1970s steel girders. And let me actually let the camera, there we go. Um, geez, of course it doesn't stop right where I want it to stop. Okay, so you can actually see that they added these heavy duty support girders. And you can actually see that there's two sets at every cross section. And this is through the whole area of the ship that they cut out C deck. So they actually replaced the structural framework with something far stronger. Now, is it seaworthy? No, I think it was built to building code standards because the ship is technically considered a building now. That's how they register it with the city building department. But basically there are these heavy duty reinforcements. I think these are four feet tall, uh, just a little over one meter for those of you folks who are not from the US. Whose dog is that? Um, and so, yeah, so they are heavily reinforced. It is not at all in danger of collapsing. These are stronger than what was there. It's just not designed to be seaworthy. Uh, and so that was something I wanted to point out to you guys. And they did not cut anything out of the ship without reinforcing it with something stronger. And so what's the difference between building code versus like seaworthy? Well, basically, it just means that if the ship was out at sea, it's possible that these these support girders may not be able to handle the constant motion of the ship moving at sea. So that's really all it means. And that was the first thing I wanted to kind of tell you guys. Now I'm going to read some of your guys' comments to see what I can answer. I have to go up a bit because everyone's talking very quickly. Okay, let's see. Someone asked if the Queen Mary was steam powered. Yes. The Queen Mary was steam powered. So we can see actually her boilers here and oh i have a really cool picture i hope i hope he doesn't mind um if i show 
the picture that... <sighs> I have uh, my window open because it's not hot enough today to turn on the air conditioning, but it's not <laughs> cool enough to keep the door closed. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, no, it would be under this. I'm so dumb. I should have just went straight to this. Now, the picture I'm about to show you is from a model created for something called the Yarrow Project. And I, and this model was created by, um, by Robin Jacobs of industrial, um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot uh, the name of the organization. Um, how embarrassing. I haven't said the name of the organization in a while. What is it? It's industrial... Well, anyway, to try to speed through this, because I'm trying to look for his logo. I have his logo somewhere, and I can't find it. Um, but to speed through this, I'm just going to say his name is Robin Jacobs. And um, and so he created this model, which was on display on the Queen Mary, I believe. So I believe it has been seen by the public. But I'll kind of show you. So credit to... Robin Jacobs, and also to my friend Steve Ablonsi, who was also part of the Yarrow Project and helped to design it. But basically, this is a model of two of the boiler rooms showing some of the, the tops of the boilers looking down. And so I know that there's two missing here. This was just for the sake of, of a model, you know, trying to explain things. And I'm not going to zoom in too far because, again, this is, this is like an image that, you know, we're going to show later when we do our Yarrow Project videos. But um, essentially, you're looking down at the boilers, and in each room, there was generally six boilers. And there were even larger ones. You can kind of see the difference in size. So there were two different types of boilers, um, not types, but sizes. There was a, a small size and then a large size. And then I'll go ahead and open a deck plan to show you guys. Uh. Go to my Queen Mary deck plans. Uh, that was it. And now this one. Here we go. Oh, I have ones that are in color. That'll be even better. <laughs> I should have thought about that. And I can comp compare them to the Queen Elizabeth as well. So, okay. So I have I made this basically I, I just I took a bunch of images that I found put them all together into one image and then with this I took deck plans of the Queen Mary and not only did I colorize them to color code them basically but I also created um, a deck plan of the Queen Elizabeth since I literally cannot find them online but if we look at the Queen Mary she had 24 Yarrow boilers and Yarrow boilers are Jesus, silence my phone and so yarrow boilers are a what's called a fire no no a water tube boiler system and water tube boilers means that as opposed to like a steam locomotive where you have um you have tubes of fire and exhaust from the from the firebox going through the water and exiting out the smokestack of a locomotive. Instead, with this case, what you have is fire tube, meaning that, or I'm sorry, water tube, meaning that it's the opposite, meaning that it's tubes of water that are surrounded by the fire and the heat. And so the water would boil in those tubes, creating steam. And, it, and each of these Yarrow boilers generated steam at around 450 pounds per square inch. But I'm not gonna go too much into detail um, because of the fact that we will have a live stream literally based on all of this and we're going to go into depth about how it all works, but it generated all that steam and all that steam fed the four turb um, the four steam turbine engines. Each engine consisted of four steam turbines and each engine drove a propeller. 
And so that's kind of how it works. And just to kind of give you guys a, a view, this is the difference between Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. Try to position that around. Boy, there is a lot of sirens today. Okay, so basically, the Queen Mary had 24 Yarrow Boilers, Queen Elizabeth had 12, but Queen Elizabeth's Yarrow Boilers were much larger, and uh, but they were also more efficient. And I have a video about the difference between Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth's uh, steam-powered systems, and no, the Queen Elizabeth was not faster than the Queen Mary. She could not produce that kind of speed because... While she did have larger boilers, they just didn't produce the volume of steam needed to make her go faster than Queen Mary. She could meet the Queen Mary's um, uh, service speed, though, which was 28, 29 um, knots, which was the general service speed. So they were designed to go the same service speed, just that Queen Mary was designed to be the racehorse of the two. And... Um, and so, yeah, and then you might have noticed that there are three boilers here in the forward room, and these were specifically used for, these were scotch boilers, double-ended scotch boilers. Uh, imagine Titanic's boilers, but larger. And so these double-ended double scotch boilers, they produced steam for the two turbo generator rooms and also for the hotel. So I believe the, I, I say hotel, but... What I mean is for the passenger accommodation. So I believe one boiler would have basically produced enough steam for all the passenger, um, all the passenger accommodations, and then the other two would have been enough to produce for the turbo generator rooms. But of course, that was divvied up differently based on the day and the demand. It wasn't always divvied up that equally. Um, but yes, and then last thing was Queen Mary was not coal fired like Titanic. Queen Mary was oil fired. So you have all these tanks that line the double bottom keel and the and the hull well the double bottom keel had had uh water ballast but the double hull along the sides of the ships both queen mary and queen elizabeth um had these large areas that are i colored in gray to show the oil tanks and some of these weren't even oil tanks um some of these were were water ballast so you know but it was just easier to color them all gray. But essentially, yeah, that's what it was. So that's just to answer your question real quick. I'll zoom out there and I'll answer another question. Okay, let's see. Uh, so hello to everybody I didn't say hello to, just in case. So, uh, Mary asks the height of Queen Mary. Uh, let's see. Well, did I put it on here? I, might, I hope I did. Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. Well, basically, what I can tell you, I don't remember from I don't remember from keel to top of mast, but I do remember from keel to top of the forward funnel is 187 feet, which is actually very large for some of my Disneyland fans here. Disneyland's Matterhorn Mountain, the tallest structure in Disneyland, is 147 feet. So Matterhorn really only comes up to the height of the uh, uh, the bridge of the Queen Mary, maybe a little bit over the bridge of the Queen Mary. That would be the height of Matterhorn Mountain at Disneyland. So the funnel goes up even higher than that by, you know, 30 some odd feet. So pretty neat, <laughs> honestly. Well, actually 20 some odd feet, but still pretty neat uh, how high Queen Mary is. And from what I know, when they built the Verrazano Narrows Bridge in New York, right where the, the Queen Mary would sail into the harbor um, and up the Hudson, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge would clear the top of Queen Mary's um, mast by just a matter of meters or feet, just, you know, depending on the tide, really. Um, I think there might have been, at sometimes in high tide, just 12 feet of clearance, maybe even less. So, yeah, Queen Mary was quite tall and larger than Titanic. Um, I bet I have, yeah, I do. Okay, I want to show you guys something cool. It's a comparison that I put together. I didn't make it 
per se, just like I didn't necessarily make this. I just colorized it and then added some things to it. Let's see, it's in my Queen Mary versus Titanic video. Okay, and I have a graphic, aha. So this is a graphic I made for my video called um, Titanic versus Queen Mary. And it shows the length. So you can see that the length of Titanic was 882 feet, which is 269 meters, uh, with a weight of 52,310 long tons. Not gross tons, long tons. Some people measure the ships in gross tons in order to figure out um, their size. But this is long tons, meaning actual weight. So the actual weight of Titanic, if you were to place it on the ground, would be 52,310 long tons, while Queen Mary's actual weight, if you placed her on the ground, would be 77,400 long tons. Um, and she was a good 137, if I'm remembering this off the top of my head, I'm not doing math in my head right now, but 137 feet longer than Titanic, and she was three decks higher. Titanic had nine decks, Queen Mary has 12 decks. So, and of course their width is also different too. T Titanic being 92 feet or 28 meters, uh, Queen Mary being 118 feet or 36 meters. So she was significantly larger. And in fact, I can show you when I place the two over top each other, you can see where Titanic's bow and stern end compared to Queen Mary. And if we zoom in a little bit, you can see where the bridge of Titanic, which is right here, is compared to the bridge of Queen Mary, which is right here, a whole three decks further up. And so, yeah. And this is something I haven't figured out yet, but I think Titanic's mast was taller than Queen Mary's mast. But maybe that didn't matter because these two ships are not sitting keel to keel. They're sitting waterline to waterline. But I don't know, maybe that did matter, I don't know. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of something cool to show you guys. Now let me get back to your questions. Uh, okay. Railfan asks, I have a quick question. Do you plan on visiting Queen Mary when it opens? I wanted to. Originally, they were saying that they were hoping to open around October 1st, and I just so happened to be going down to Southern California in October 1st. Um, but uh, it, now they're saying fall because they're not sure if they can meet that opening deadline. So if that's the case, I may not be able to be there when she reopens because I'm going to be spending a lot of money going down to Southern California this October in the first place. I don't think I can do that twice this year. So. It may not happen, unfortunately. I really wanted it to because I wanted to be able to, to film the whole ship in high definition 4K, stern to stem, top to bottom, um, but it doesn't look like that's gonna happen. Uh, estimate how many rooms are on Queen Mary as of right now. Oh, I, I don't know, hundreds, hundreds upon hundreds. There are, when it comes to, to stateroom cabins, there are currently at least 330. So that's just staterooms. That's not even public rooms either. So I, I could tell you there's hundreds. Um, what if Queen Mary was steam powered? She was steam powered. What if there was a Queen Mary three? I, I don't know. Maybe there might be. I wouldn't put it past them. I mean, there's uh there's a, uh, there's a, you know, there's technically a, a Queen Elizabeth three, although it's not called Queen Elizabeth three, it's just called Queen Elizabeth. But, um, all right, let's, I was just at a comment reading it. Uh, okay. I read that, read that. Okay. Do you think someday the Queen Mary 2 will... Oh, that has nothing... Yeah, I'm sorry. I, can't, I don't want to answer questions that don't have something to do with the original Queen Mary. Um, because that's what this live stream is about, folks. So I'm going to answer questions that have something to do with the original Queen Mary. Uh, 
Okay. Fog Bank Industrial Arts. Thank you so much, Lake. Oh my gosh. I Yes, so the picture I showed you guys of the model of Queen Mary's boiler rooms was courtesy of Fog Bank Industrial Arts. That is Robin Jacobs. So thank you so much. I for some reason I could not remember the name for the life of me. And I was looking for his I have his his um his logo because I've been working on on the um the Yarrow project video and so I couldn't find the logo for some reason. Um Someone asked about if Queen Mary will continue to issue season passes when she reopens. I, I don't know. Um, really, I'm just here to answer questions about the history, the design, and the technology of the Queen Mary. So if you guys have any questions, like anything at all that has to do with the history, design, architecture, or engineering of the Queen Mary, you know, anything at all. I mean, I know there's tons of, like, there's tons of questions. People are like, what, what rooms still exist? What things, you know, if you guys have questions like that, I can answer those. Um, okay. Yeah, no one's asking me any questions. The historic travel says, Armas Queen Mary model is very big. Who designed the Queen Mary? Um, that was the, uh, that was the engineers at, Cly at uh, John Brown Shipyards in Clydebank, Scotland. I, my brain is not working this morning uh, or today. Um, yes, that was the engineers at John Brown Shipyards of Clydebank, Scotland, and they had designed the Queen Mary. And in fact, I can show you guys a cool little video footage of them testing. Let's see, it's under this one. Testing the model. Do, 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 do. Well, first, here's a photo of them doing some construction while you guys wait. Oh, here's a fun fact, and I was working on this just the other day. Um, so originally the Queen Mary was, where is it, this thing? So originally the Queen Mary, when they were designing it in 1929, they were thinking, how are we going to build this ship? And so basically they had thought of the Aquitania, which was a successful design. And so, um, and so they decided that they were going to try to see if they could build the hull using the Aquitania's hull design. So here's a very rare picture of concept art of the Queen Mary with a hull design that looks like the Aquitania. You can even tell by the um, the recessed deck area here, which is, you know, interrupts the, the line, the flow of the ship. And um, yeah, so this was a pretty cool picture. I had to put this through an AI uh, software to make it more high definition because it was just so hard to see but um but yeah so that's kind of a cool little thing about the queen mary but eventually as they were designing the ship they kind of realized what they needed was an all new design they they didn't want to oh here's a picture of the yarrow boilers this is them at the manufacturing facility the yarrow facility and um they look different than other boilers that you've probably seen before that's because well, I don't want to explain too much, actually, because we have a whole live stream on that next week. So I don't want to explain too much. Um, let's see. Uh, still looking for the thing. So, yeah, that is a really rare image of the Queen Mary with an Aquitania hull. I'm just scrolling, looking for a video I have of them testing the model of the Queen Mary in the water. Uh, here we go. So I'll let this play for you guys. The sound is off because I don't want to get copyrighted like I always do. Lake says, did you know there are two abandoned single passenger cabins with two portholes, a private bathroom on Queen Mary? I just sent some pictures I took of the rooms. To Steve Ablonsi. Oh, interesting. I did hear about because Steve did tell me that there were some abandoned rooms, um, 
abandoned passenger cabins. So he did tell me about that, but I've never seen pictures of them. So hopefully maybe he'll share those with me too. But um, so this is, this is a video of one of the models. Um, this was a, I want to say a nine meter or six meter long model. I forget. And as, as you can see, it had working propellers. And so this was how they tested the Queen Mary in a very large tank to see how the ship would move in the water. Now, of course, they didn't have computer technology to do all of the calculations like they do today. Oh, is that really it? Oh my gosh. Um, and so they literally had to build a model, you know, and here's a little cool thing. The Queen Mary had, when she went into service, she had 12 lifeboats, I'm sorry, 24 lifeboats, 12 on each side. But here you can actually see that there are 14 on each side. And where this is today is a large clearing behind the veranda. The veranda would be like right here today. And then there's a large clearing. And if you were to like walk over here, you can look out and see the stern of the ship. So originally the Queen Mary is going to have 14 lifeboats. Um, but I think that they changed that because I think they made the other lifeboats larger. So I think that's why you see this change of lifeboat configuration is because they just built larger lifeboats instead of having 14 of them. So pretty interesting. Um, and it, yeah, yeah, pretty interesting. So let me see if you guys have any questions about Queen Mary. And yeah, not that one. Okay. <clears throat> Ah, here we go. Taylor says, what all places on the ship would they have used to bunk soldiers during World War II? I'm just trying to get a rough idea, possibly, where my grandpa would have bunked. Okay, well, actually, I do have something that might help you with that. Um, for my video about um, the Queen Mary in World War II, ooh, did I put it here or did I put it in the actual video file? Uh, oh, well... While we wait, here's a rendering of what Queen Mary would have looked like just after the war. I'm going to say, because of the painted funnels, I'm going to say this was what she looked like when she was um, carrying the war brides after the war had ended. Had ended Because during the war, her funnels were gray. Um, there's a picture of her gray funnels, but let me see. I created a a rendering for my video showing uh, showing where the troops would have had access to is that i think that's it here we go okay so one thing you'll need to know if you're going to figure out you know where your grandfather was bunked was you'll need to know what color he was coated. So they were given colors. So they either had, um, you know, red, white, or blue. And as you can see, this is where they would have been placed. And the reason why they were separated that way was because they didn't want the soldiers to have just free room of the ship. Because if they did, and let's say there was, I don't know, something off the starboard stern or, you know, the port side bow right and they all rushed to go see what it was the ship it was so overloaded with people sometimes 16,000 or more troops on board the ship and the ship was only designed for a maximum capacity of about 3,000 passengers and so um and so if they had all gone to one area to go see something the ship could have completely like listed to one side and it, you know that would just been a huge safety problem so they separated the soldiers into three areas. They were not allowed to cross over unless an officer had allowed them to. And um, if we kind of zoom in, um, the red, they had the bow and there was a lot of, what there was here was there was a lot of third class cabins in this general vicinity. And then there was a lot of um, 
crew quarters in this general facility. So the the third class passenger cabins and the crew quarters, uh, they were used for the red group. And then the, the group that were in the white, um, they had access to certain rooms, like the Queen Mary's pool, for instance, was converted into bunks. So let me go to... Uh, uh -huh. and so here's one picture of the Queen Mary's first class pool. Now what you can kind of make out here is the steel slide that goes down into the pool. And then behind it is, is the, um, the dual staircase and the tile work. And then you can see the little stork that was on the back panel here. And so they added a floor over the pool and these bunks are literally sitting over the pool. I have another picture too from the opposite angle. So in this angle, you can actually see all the bunks. Here is the slide right here, the steel slide. And uh, they put a deck over it. They built these wooden pillars and everything. So there were multiple levels of bunks in the pool area. So they would have placed them in, in areas like that. Um, so even, whoa. So yeah, even though they may not have been in a cabin, they could have been in a public room that was converted, but there were a lot of first class cabins. And for instance, a cabin that would have held normally, let's say two passengers, let's say, cause if, you, if they were down at the bottom here somewhere, eh, well, the, this image isn't good for it, but oh, the other one is, let me see, not that one. This one, ah, so this one kind of sort of shows you some third class cabins, which were just above the boiler rooms. So if they were in the white area, they would have had the boiler, the, the cabins over the boiler rooms and things like that. And if it, if the cabin was designed for two people, it could have as many as 12 soldiers bunked in there. So it would have just been absolutely, absolute, absolute heck. <laughs> I can't even talk this morning or today, I should say. I keep thinking it's morning, but it's because it's so cloudy outside. But um, And then the stern, the people at the stern, they would have stayed in the second class cabins and more crew quarters. So, yeah, that's kind of how it would have worked on the Queen Mary back then. Now, back to your guys' questions. Where was the second class pool? They should rebuild the pool for hotel guest use. That is exactly my thoughts as well. They should rebuild the second class pool for the hotel guests. The second class pool was located at the stern of the ship. And if we zoom in here, it was located on E deck. So you entered the pool on E deck and then, um, and then the actual tank of the pool was located on F deck. So yeah. And let me see, do I still have my my deck plans open? No. Uh, open. Oh, what is it? Yeah, here we go, yeah, E-deck, okay. Yeah, so they would have come down either this set of elevators or this set of stairs, there would have been a very narrow foyer, very narrow, like not even like the width of a hallway. And then there would have been glass doors, or I believe they were glass doors that led into the second class pool room. And let me see if I can find you a picture of the pool. Images, decks, uh-huh. Okay, so the doors into the pool room would have been on the right side. They're, they're not in the picture, but um, but yeah, you would have seen the pool here. It was a kind of kind of low ceilings, not very high ceilings. Um, and then the the dressing rooms would have been behind this bulkhead here. Do I have a picture? I do a picture of the dressing rooms. So these are the second class dressing rooms. The second class dressing rooms, and this is the surprising part, you guys, the second class dressing rooms actually looked nicer than the first class dressing rooms of the, of the Queen Mary's first class pool room. It's crazy, but they did. They looked so much better. 
and they were they actually had like nice like um you know uh formica and roanoid paneling and stuff like that it just was very very nice so that's that there's the pool here's another picture of the of the pool looking so this is still looking aft but it's on the opposite side of the pool as the previous picture. And um, you can actually kind of see the pool level is leaning more towards the port side. Um, this pool was centered with the ship, just so you know. So if I go back to this, this, this line that crosses the image here, this is the center line of the ship. So it was centered with the ship, but the thing is, is that uh, as the ship rolled, the pool water moved. And so if there was a particularly heavy seas, they would have to drain the pools on the ship so that way it didn't increase the movement of that. Now here is what that area looked like in the 1970s as they cleared it out. Now the, the pool, this would have been, this center deck that my mouse is going over, would have been E deck. And you would have entered the pool room from this deck around this area over here. And then in the middle here would have been the pool. And at the bottom was an opening where uh, the filtration system would have emptied out into the deck below this. And the filtration system would have been down there to clean it or whatever, um, and even pump it out of the ship if necessary. Um, and so this was one of the areas that was gutted. But once again, these are not the original pillars that supported the upper decks of the ship. These were added in the 1970s. In this picture, these were brand new. And you can actually see here is, what is this? This would have been D-deck. This is D-deck up here. And a great chunk of D-deck is blocked off from these massive steel girders that they added to make up for the loss of deck support. So these are not original, these are new, and you can see again, they are double. So they are extra heavy duty to handle the weight of the ship above. So again, reiterating my previous comment from earlier, the ship is, is not structurally unsound. It's not going to collapse because they removed all these decks. They reinforced it with something much stronger. It's just not reinforced to a maritime seaworthy code. It's reinforced to a building code. But nevertheless, it's still there. But yeah, interesting little photo there for you guys. So just a reminder, everyone, I'm only going to be reading comments that have something to do with the Queen Mary because that's the topic of the video today. Uh... Um, someone was asking about the purple color code on the deck plan that I showed you for the um, for the the soldiers during World War II. The purple was the engineering spaces. That meant just spaces you couldn't occupy. Um, I, I color coded it purple for that reason because you couldn't occupy those. Those were all boiler rooms, turbo generator rooms, water softening plant, cargo holds. And some of the cargo holds were used for the prisoners of war. So, you know, it, yeah, I, that's why I colored it purple. But going back up to the comments, let's see. I am a little bit behind on your guys' comments because I'm trying to get to all the ones that that, um, you know, I can. Okay, I read that one. Brian says, do you have a favorite history fact about the Grand Ballroom? I'm assuming you mean the first class um, main lounge. Um, do I have a favorite fact about it? I mean, yeah, I do, actually. Um, I, I told it in my video about um, the Rolling Mary video which is that uh, there was a story told by um, by a former crewman, Ralph Rushton, and he talked about how he was, they were on a particularly stormy seas one time, and, um, and the piano that was in the main lounge had broke free. Now, nobody was in the main lounge because the seas were so rough, the passengers were confined to their cabins. Um, for their safety, but the seas were so rough that the, that the piano had broke, broken free. And, um, 
and it was rolling around the main lounge, smashing all the furniture, damaging the lower areas of the wall paneling. And I even believe that that, that, that piano was the very reason why the, um, the, uh, the onyx lanterns in the main lounge. Let me show you a picture of the main lounge. Promenade. Uh, main lounge. So here's an example of the onyx lanterns. So there's one on each side here. And then I'll show you a, a photo of the main lounge as it existed back then. You can see the onyx lanterns. They line the main pillars here. Um, do I have a better picture of that? I do, but I don't know why it's not here. Uh, anyway, so yeah, see, there they, there they are. No, that's that's our deck. Well, anyway, when you see these onyx lanterns today, onyx is a really hard stone, and if you look at some of the lanterns, they are cracked and broken, and. That's not something that happens by bumping a chair or something against these things, especially with how high up they are. Uh, these, um, you can see there's a notch here in this pillar. That's for the ropes that they tie for heavy seas um, so that way passengers can walk around safely. They hold onto the ropes. That's at waist level for an average, size, uh, average height person. So that's waist level. So the piano would have been high enough to crack these... Uh, these lower sections. And in fact, if you look at them today, some of them are cracked. And I believe that that happened because of that piano story. And um, and then what ended up happening was because the piano had damaged the whole room, they had to literally spend a week uh, rebuilding the room. They had all these workers come in, install all brand new furniture, all brand new everything to fix up the room. And the only sign of that piano story today is the onyx lanterns that are damaged. So <laughs> honestly, and they're not, they're not so badly damaged that, you know, that uh, they look ugly, like not at all. This is what, this is what the room looked like. You know, this was taken sometime in the mid sixties. So this would have been after the, the story of the piano crashing through the lounge. But uh, that is also a reason why there's different furniture in this room than there was before <laughs> because it was all smashed up. As Ralph Russian had said, it was all broke up to the size of a matchstick. So <laughs> that's one of my favorite fun facts about that room. Okay, back to comments. Taylor says, what was the capacity of the lifeboats for Queen Mary when she entered service in 1936? So there were different kinds of lifeboats. There were um, there were two different kinds. There was accident boats, which was the, the two boats on the forward end of the ship. Um, let me see if I have a picture for that. Oh, yeah, a couple. Um, but basically, this is an image of Queen Mary's lifeboats. They were steel plated lifeboats riveted together. Um, so they're not wooden like a lot of people think they are. Um, but basically the accident lifeboats had a capacity of 100, no, or was it 96? The accident lifeboats had a capacity of 96 passengers and they were 30 feet long and nine feet wide. Um, but the full-size lifeboats, of which there were 22 of them, uh, were 36 feet long, 12 feet wide, and they had a capacity of 145 passengers each. Now, if I'm remembering correctly, because I'm not going to count it all up in my head right now, but if I remember correctly, with all 24 lifeboats counted up, there was enough capacity that there were about it, it, it there was enough room that they could have fit 
about 42 or 43 more passengers. So it was enough capacity that there could have been 43 more passengers on that ship or, or crew on that ship um, if, they, if they had needed. So that was it. So Queen Mary definitely had more than enough, but more than enough by about 43 passengers. And here's an old photo of the lifeboats. This is... Um, this was when the lifeboats were being installed on the ship for the very first time in 1936, and they had just come from the manufacturer. So the outside of the of the lifeboats, they were steel, but they had wooden interiors, and they're standing on these um, on some of the the seating planks. But underneath the seating planks are tanks, and you might have seen that in the lifeboats uh, before they were removed from the ship recently. Um, they had all you could see that was left was these orange tanks and those tanks were for various things some of them held um, supplies like food water um, uh, first aid kits and fuel so some of them held fuel and some were just um, uh, for air so especially underneath this bench that my mouse is going over underneath this bench were the air tanks and they were air because um, they were for buoyancy. So in case, this is what's cool about the lifeboat. Um, each of the benches had a watertight bulkhead underneath. So if a, if a leak, for instance, had sprung at the very bow of the boat, it couldn't spread throughout the rest of the lifeboat because there were watertight bulkheads along the lifeboat. But let's just say something weird happened and the water was able to seep through every watertight bulkhead and reach the entire lifeboat and the lifeboat started sinking. It would not fully sink even though it was fully loaded with passengers. And the reason why was because of the of the air buoyancy tanks on both sides of the hull of the lifeboat made it so that way the, the boat couldn't sink. You would have to have an extraordinary set of circumstances to make these lifeboats sink. And that was kind of the cool thing about them. So, um, yeah, pretty, pretty neat. I like the cowl vents, but I can't help but to think a whole person could fit in one easily. So easily. Um, yeah, they, yeah, they could. I mean, I don't know why anybody would want to climb in them. That's just like you're asking for certain death. <laughs> uh, how fast was Queen Mary asks... Wolf Lord. So Queen Mary's fastest recorded speed happened during her speed trials in 1936. She reached 32.84 knots. Now, that's the fastest recorded speed for peacetime, but um, there is a story um, told by. Um, let's see if I can find the thing. Um, there's a story that in World War II, the Queen Mary would sometimes encounter parts of the seas that were infested with enemy submarines, and they would need to speed right through it in order to not get torpedoed. And so in order to, let me just exit out of these, in order to do that, um, is it in this one? I have a screenshot of it somewhere. Um, but in order to do that, this person who was on the Queen Mary during wartime said that if they needed to speed through an area that was particularly, um, that was uh, uh, an area that was particularly infested with enemy submarines, they could speed through it if the captain ordered that all the safety systems that would normally prevent things like overpressurized steam and, you know, and uh, over speed of the engines, those things could be disengaged temporarily. So that way they could actually run the Queen Mary at a higher speed. So her, for instance, her boilers would do a service, uh, a service pressure of 450 pounds per square inch. Well, supposedly they could run that up to 700 pounds per square inch in an emergency. And of course that was not considered safe. It by no means was it considered safe, but it was done to get the Queen Mary through 
uh, an area that was infested with submarines. And so supposedly, according to um, according to a, a abstract log, they had clocked that the Queen Mary had surpassed 38 knots when she did that. And so that in itself is a really interesting story. And I'm looking for, because it was, the story was also told in a book. And my friend Steve told me um, what book it was in. And I screenshotted what he said, so that way I had something to reference it. But, of course, right when I need to find exactly what I'm looking for, I cannot find it. I'm looking right now as I was telling you the story, and I can't find my screenshot of it. Because, you got to remember, guys, my files of the Queen Mary, there are thousands of things in here. And I organize it as best I can, but... but even I am not perfect at organization. I have difficulty sometimes. Um, and of course, when I end this live stream, I'm going to find it. It's going to randomly pop up, and I'm going to be like, dang it, I couldn't show people this thing. Um, but anyway, yes. So supposedly, if the Queen Mary was trying to get through in submarine-infested waters and they disengaged all the safety systems, they could run her at 38 knots with overpressurized boilers in order to get her out of that area. But it was brief. It probably was only like an hour or two that they did that, and then they would, they would, um, you know, lower the boiler pressure, slow down the ship back to normal operational speeds, and then, you know. Uh, let's see. Can you show a photo of Queen Mary's bridge? I can do better. I have video of the Queen Mary's bridge. Unless you want to see a historic photo, if that's what you're asking. Um, okay, here we go. I'll let this play and I'll, I'll open up some historic photos of Queen Mary's bridge. So that's me pointing at the bridge wings, which were used for docking. You would look over the bridge wings to see how far the edge of the dock was from the hull of the ship and so on and so forth. It was mostly used by the harbor pilots and the captain. Uh, jizz. Well, that's weird. Well, I'm not going to spend forever looking for a photo of the bridge. The bridge looks pretty much as it as it did in the early days. There's almost nothing different, really, especially in this view. Um, but what I can tell you is there were four telegraphs that specifically operated the engines of the ship. So here's two of them, and then the there were uh, two others on the left side over here. This one, and then there was one off screen. Um, and those... Those commanded the engines of the ships. And then there was this telegraph here, which commanded the, um, I believe that one was specifically for steering. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. This telegraph was specifically for steering and they didn't need it, right? They had these three helms. Two of them were the normal operating helms. Um, but let's just say, <laughs> They had these two helms for redundancy, right? So if one helm wasn't working, they could use the other one and vice versa. Um, but let's just say those two helms were not functional. Then what they could do is they could use the telegraph to relay the steering instructions to the steering room directly. And they had a helm, and they had a helm in there that would uh, that they could steer the ship from down there. They could also technically steer the ship from the um, from the uh, the docking bridge at the stern of the ship. The docking bridge at the stern of the ship also had a helm for steering the ship, normally for purposes of docking. Um, but, you know, there were like four different ways to steer the ship um, in case something went wrong. And then uh, this helm over here is nicknamed the Iron Mike. It was designed to maintain a course heading out at sea. It was like an autopilot in that sense, but it was only designed to maintain a straight heading. So you could tell it, oh, you know, this many degrees to um, to the east or to starboard, whatever they say. I don't know what they say, but they would tell it what course it needed to, to steer for. And then this thing 
would keep the Queen Mary on a straight course for that heading. So pretty cool. That's what the Iron Mike did. But I do not believe the Iron Mike was was good at steering the ship if you if you needed it to. Like if 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 everything else of the ship failed and you needed to steer the ship, I don't believe the Iron Mike could steer the ship. You could tell it what course to head for, but that's about it. It would maintain that course. But if you needed to like make a sharp curve or something, like to avoid an iceberg, for instance, I don't believe the Iron Mike could have done that for you. I think you would have needed um, any of the, the the two helms here or the helm at the docking bridge or the steering room itself to steer the ship for you. Um, and then I'll just keep letting this play. Um. Taylor asks about the, about the, um, the soldiers, when they were on the Queen Mary, they were given buttons that were given a color code. So you were either the white section, the red section, or the blue section. And I don't believe there was a specific designation. To the best of my knowledge, I don't believe there was a specific designation like, oh, you're part of this regimen, so automatically you are red section. I don't think it was like that. I think really it was just first come first serve basically you know if your if your regimen or your group um was the first of a certain time frame you were given a button for that you know it was just first come first serve they just handed out the buttons you know um of course they wouldn't split up regimens so you know if 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 the last person in your regimen happened to go from being a white button to him suddenly being a red button or something like that um, it, they wouldn't split them up. They would just say, okay, okay, here's here's an extra white button. Stay with your regimen. But other than that, you know, they they would separate it that way is, as far as I understand it. So, yeah. Now, you'll see the bridge wings are blocked off. Now, when I was a kid, they weren't blocked off. But they're blocked off now because they have been in such a state of disrepair that the floor of the bridge wing extending out from the ship may not be strunk, structurally sound enough to hold a few people. So um, they blocked it off to prevent anyone from falling through the floor and plunging, you know, 99 feet. I think it really is 100 feet. Yeah, because the lifeboats are sitting, are sitting um, 96 feet above the water and you're a good at least 10 feet above the lifeboats. Jeez, 106 feet. Yeah, you'd plunge 106 feet to the water below. That would not be a happy landing. Um, so that's why they blocked it off. Hopefully one day they're able to repair that structurally so people can go back out on there again. So, Stephen asks, if the troops were used crew accommodations, where did the crew live? There was a minimum crew. So, you have to remember there, the Queen Mary was, when she was in peacetime, she would have 1,100 crew members on board to do various things. But because of the war, they were significantly reduced. They only had, you know, maybe 300 crew members on the ship, maybe even less. Um, because really all you needed was the people who steered and operated the ship. And then, of course, you needed people to operate the the, the um, kitchens and galleys and stuff like that. And then the, the soldiers did the rest. The soldiers would be assigned to cleaning up vomit, uh, you know, um, fixing toilets, stuff like that. So the soldiers themselves did most of their own work. Um, but, uh, but I think for the maybe 300 or less crew who were on board the Queen Mary during the war... They, they still had some of their crew cabins. Like, for instance, the officers of the ship still had their officers' cabins, which are on the deck below this one that we're standing on in this video. Um, so they still had their cabins. It's just that most of the crew cabins went to, um, went to the GIs, to the soldiers. Thomas asks, 
where was the second class gym? So the second class gym, I don't, of course, I don't have the deck plan open, um, was right next to the pool. So if we go to E-deck, there's the pool on E-deck. And instead of going straight through the doors, you would make a left and then you could go into the gymnasium. And so, let me see, E-deck, I'll try to get you guys a picture of the, of course. I have a picture of the gymnasium somewhere, but I didn't put it in my original file. I put it in some other file. Sometimes when I make videos, you guys, sometimes when I find a photo of something, like let's say the gymnasium, I put it in my file for that video instead of doing the smart thing and putting it in my file of the Queen Mary in general. So that way I could share it with you. I don't know where that picture is, but, but yeah. So the gymnasium is right here. And it was small and there was, a, you know, a few offerings and things like that, you know, nothing that, nothing that big. That's a second class gymnasium, just in case you're wondering. And the dressing rooms. Oh, I was wrong about the dressing rooms. They weren't on the aft wall. They were actually on the port side of the ship. So these are them. There would have been men's and there would have been women's. Which ones are which? Uh... I don't remember which side is men's and which is women's, but they were separated that way, so. Uh, uh, K4RNA, thank you so much for joining the membership. Okay, I gotta get through these questions. So many questions. Okay. Ian asks about what kind of um, funnels did Queen Mary have. Queen Mary's funnels were a lot like Queen Elizabeth's, except that um, except that it wasn't easy to see the actual exhaust tubes the way you could with Queen Elizabeth. Like if you flew over Queen Elizabeth, it was very easy to see, you know, the six exhaust tubes per um, per funnel. But on Queen Mary, the exhaust tubes were a bit further down, so it was just very dark and it was hard to see. But it was a lot like Queen Elizabeth's. Um, if I recall as well, Titanic had a similar thing. It's just that, again, it was so far down, you couldn't really see it from above. So Titanic's funnels were not just open, like a big open tube, like not a single big open tube. That's not how funnels are built. Funnels are a lot like chimneys in a in a home. So let's say you have a multi-story building and there's a line of chimneys on every floor that goes all the way up to the roof. It's not one big open hole because if it was, you know, well, let's not get into that. Um, what it is is that they each each chimney ends up funneling down into a small tube, and then those tubes are separate at the top of the chimney. So it's the same thing with a funnel on an ocean liner. Um, every boiler has its own individual tube, and part of that reason is so that way, um, let's say for some reason, if it was on a coal-fired ship, let's say one of the boilers was producing a lot of soot for some reason, you wouldn't want it to cl all that soot to clog up other boilers you just want to isolate it to that problem so instead you'd have the tube go all the way up and it would remain that single tube for that particular boiler um that's pretty much kind of how it worked on all ocean liners there might have been some few exceptions but they were very rarely just a an open giant tube like that it was very rare when it was like that so um but quite often it looks that way because when you look into them from above, especially with the old photographs, you can't see the individual tubes inside. So, um, yeah, that's why it makes it so difficult. But, yeah. Uh, Blake says, Alex, have you ever seen a color photo of the second class pool? A photo, not a drawing. I've seen a colorized photo of the second class pool. 
it was basically the same photo I showed you guys earlier, but it was just colorized. But I've never seen an actual, like, you know, Technicolor photo um, of the second class pool. Thomas asks about the working alleyways on the Queen Mary. I don't know why my, my sinuses are clogging up. Okay, so on D deck of Queen Mary is where the working alleyways were. And uh, it's hard to see, but they would have been on the port side of the ship. And they would have started uh, just about like right here, basically. But these were like crew cabins and things. So, but basically you had here and then the and then the crew way went no 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 this can't be it this can't be it i'm looking at it now i'm like that doesn't make sense c deck there we go the reason why is because c deck used to be called d deck so i always get confused so you know <laughs> c deck used to be d deck so on c deck of the queen mary um the the working alleyways used to start from basically right here where the crew cabins were and then it went aft beyond the boiler hatches here's the swimming pool and then the alleyway went past through here oh this by the way is the is the bottom floor of the pool room so not the top floor where there's a balcony this is the bottom floor and then the the working alleyway went past that there's the dressing rooms for the first class pool and then it went further back here there was all kinds of things, printer shops and, you know, carpentry and, you know, stuff like that. And the further after you went towards the kitchens, you started getting into the kitchen storage. Um, so, yeah. And it's funny because a friend of mine saw this. He says, wait, there was a grocery store inside the Queen Mary? <laughs> it's not what you think. It's um, So it is grocery, which means that there's like food and, and pantry items. But store is just a short word for storage. So it was a grocery storage, but it wasn't a grocery store like a shop. Um, otherwise, it would have been called, a you know, like a, like a shop. But um, yeah, so they had roots and vegetables and, you know, potatoes. Yeah, they had a whole room for potatoes. Can you believe that? And that makes sense, too. A lot of people don't know this about I used to be a chef, but a lot of people don't know this about potatoes, but you got to keep them in very specific conditions if you want to store them for a long period of time. And they must be in absolute darkness or else they'll develop, they'll develop the, uh, the, um, the green uh, uh, poisonous color. So, yeah. So along the working alleyway, this is where you get to all the kitchen stuff. Um, and then if you continue past that, um, you get to where like the beers and the stouts were kept and, um, and then the engineers mess rooms, the mail space. And so everything on the starboard side was like anything from, uh, second class cabins to third class cabins. Yeah. See, this one is third class accommodations. And what's really funny is. If you really want to see like how small Queen Mary third class cabins were, this bank of um, of two bunk third class cabins is large enough. If you put all six together, that could be a modern medium sized cabin on a cruise ship. Not even like the big ones, just like just like a like a normal like standard size cabin on a cruise ship. That's how, that's how small these little rooms were. And then they had to share bathrooms. So you see these three random rooms up here. These would have been toilets. They could have been something else because sometimes they're labeled as lavatories. Yeah, like, see, this is lavatory. So never mind, I was wrong about that. This is the lavatories. There were two different lavatories. And you can actually see that it may look like this is one open walkway, but then you see this wall here. Well, that's not a wall. That's a watertight bulkhead with a watertight door. So these different areas were separated by watertight doors. And you'll also notice that since they were separated into watertight compartments, each one had their own stairwell. So here's a stairwell for this section. And then you look over here and there are stairwells for this section. Things like that. This is one section that I wish that they had left intact because today they don't use this. This is one big open area. Um, and so 
Yeah, it was, it's been subdivided into like offices, but what I mean to say is that it's not really useful. And so I wish they had just kept this area of third class cabins intact so you could like bring people down this double stairway and show them around what third class cabins looked like, even if they didn't save all the other cabins on the ship. But anyway, you know, such is the pity. So let's go back to the questions. Uh, what happened to the second class cabins on D deck on the Queen Mary? Um, okay. Were there second class cabins? Oh yeah, I guess they were. Um, well, they have been since removed. We did talk about this uh, on one of the episodes. I forget which episode of of uh, the thing, but let me go to what that area looks like today. So today, that area is the uh, main lobby of the Queen Mary Museum. So I showed you that video, you guys, earlier where um, I walked into the main lobby. Let me go find that for you guys again. You enter on D deck. So this was those cabins. So they removed all that. They removed the C deck cabins as well. So we talked about this earlier in this live stream as well. I, I told you about how they replaced the the structural framework with new, much stronger structural framework since they were ripped out the two different levels and stuff like that. So yeah. That's what that was. Oh, and here's another interesting thing. You see these these elevators here? Well, these go down to the tourist swimming pool, right? So if I go back up and reopen that that deck plan, come on. So those, keep in mind the elevators and the staircase. We're gonna go back to what that area looks like today. And here you see the sweeping staircase that goes down. This isn't the original staircase. This is new. This was created specifically for the museum. But in the center of the museum, I have to go back to that video that I just exited out of. Uh, here. In the center of the museum is this weird circular structure. And I remember walking in here and going, I wonder what that's for. Originally, I, for some reason, because back then I was not experienced in the Queen Mary. So back then I thought, oh, maybe that's the lower part of the funnel or something, which I was totally wrong. This is far, far aft of the, of the third funnel. Um, but I was trying to figure out what is in there. And when I did, I saw this blueprint. And you can see two little squares inside the oval. And when I looked at the original deck plans, there's the two squares, those are the elevators. So the elevator shaft still goes through that area today. The elevator shaft is mostly, I would say structurally wise is intact, although its aesthetic is completely gone. Um, but the elevators are, are there to this day. And, um, and so I suppose that if they ever wanted to restore that level and create a second class swimming pool again that this time could be used for um, hotel guests, they could probably bring those elevators back to operation because the, the shaft is still there. Oof, okay, so that's that. Thomas asks, where was the drawing room on Queen Mary? It was on the... Um, it was on promenade deck in the main hall. So if you go to the main hall, <clears throat> there's the, the top of the midship stairwell. Here's the shops. Here's the drawing room. And today this is a gift shop, but that's where the drawing room was on Queen Mary. Uh, how many decks does the lifeboats have? The, there, there, there are no decks. It's, it's a lifeboat.
Taylor says, do we know if there were any deaths related to the rogue wave that hit Queen Mary in World War II? So the problem with that is that that information is not Cunard's information. That information belongs to the, um, to the U.S. Army archives. And they have never, ever released information on who has died aboard the Queen Mary. Um, so we may never know, to be honest. We may never know who died and when. Um, there had to have been deaths that occurred from that rogue wave. There had to, because there were stories of men being washed overboard. <laughs> they never stopped to pick up those men. The Queen Mary was under, um, under orders to never stop for anything or anyone. So, you know, she couldn't stop and go back for people who were washed overboard. You know, there were stories of men being swept into the hallways and slamming into the bulkheads, you know, and the ship listed 52 degrees off vertical, which is such an extreme list. There's no way you could have been standing upright on the ground. You would have been forced up against the walls. Any furniture, trunks, or anything that was loose would have struck you. There had to have been deaths most certainly but we'll never ever know because that is all information private to the u.s army archives and they've never released information on the world war ii deaths aboard the queen mary now kinnard has a list of deaths that have happened during peacetime because they keep that information and that information is public but um but yeah the u.s army archives is not under any um any kind of rule that means that they have to be public about who died aboard the Queen Mary. Uh, Mark says, I would imagine that the RPMs of the screws would be cavitating like mad. They did with the original screws. So when the Queen Mary went into service in 1936, um, her original screws were, they were not hydrodynamic enough. So I'll just put it that way. Um, and so they were actually larger. So her original screws were 20 feet in diameter. I don't know what that is in meters off the top of my head, but they were 20 feet in diameter originally. And frankly, some of my British viewers probably know what feet are. So, <laughs> uh, I hear British people say feet all the time. So, um, but yeah, they were 20 feet in diameter and they did create a lot of cavitation, which affected the ship. And so in 1938, they gave the Queen Mary new smaller more hydrodynamic propellers the new propellers were 18 feet in diameter they weighed three tons less than the originals um and so yeah and those were the designs they stuck with for the rest of queen mary's career i don't say those were the propellers they stuck with because obviously you can never fully get rid of cavitation on a ship with propellers that spin this quickly um but they were able to slow the effects of the cavitation with the more hydrodynamic propellers and so each time they needed to replace Queen Mary's propellers, they always replaced them with the same exact design created in 1938. So, um, so the propellers we see on, well, the one propeller we see on the Queen Mary today um, was probably installed sometime in the mid 1960s. And, um, and yeah, uh, it was the last set of propellers to be installed on the Queen Mary before she was retired. So yeah, pretty cool. Uh, what happened to the Queen Mary's cocktail bar on main deck and what area is in the cocktail bar and main deck now on the Queen Mary? Main deck. Oh, oh, the second class cocktail bar. Okay. Um, let's see. Go to the deck plans. So... Let me open up. So it doesn't show it here because these these deck plans are kind of these were pre 1936 service. So there's some differences here, but this is the best I got for you. Um, the this is the cocktail bar on main deck for second class, and that's where it would have been. Um, and I'll show you what that area is today. It's completely open. There is nothing left of that cocktail bar because when we go zoom in here there's the stairwell the cocktail bar would have been here but there's nothing but an open walkway there so that is it there's nothing 
and we did talk about this um, in one of our previous live streams about um, the second class spaces on Queen Mary. So I showed video of, um, of someone walking through here and showing what this area looks like today. We talked in full detail about the library and the drawing room that was here and all that. So we have all that on a previous episode of Queen Mary's Lost Places. Could you show pictures of the launch of Aquitania? This this uh, live stream is only about the Queen Mary. What was in the lecture room post-war? If I remember what Steve told me correctly, it was the same thing. It was a lecture room. They didn't change it. So the lecture room remained the same even until Queen Mary came to Long Beach. Okay, I am going to. So, Master Aquitania, you've been put in timeout because you're asking questions that are absolutely have nothing to do with the live stream and you're trying to distract people with political conversation. So, you are currently in timeout for 500 seconds. Um, Steven asks In a previous presentation, reference was made to a murder suicide. What happened to the cabin after it? Okay, so the murder suicide, I had this is where I disagree with Steve, um, because I do not, I do not ag agree with, you know, Steve's um, understanding of the story. I would say, and he knows this. I've told him, um, but basically, it was it would be B deck. Here we go. So there is a story that that goes about room B340. Why does this look weird? Oh, okay, well, that is right. Well, this is where room B340 would be today. There were two different cabins in what is, you know, today, B340. And supposedly in B340, there is a ghost story that goes that some man had basically dismembered his whole family in that room and then killed himself. And, you know, and so, yeah, it was a murder-suicide. The thing is, is that only like a small fraction of that story is true. But the thing is, is that according to the information I learned, the murder-suicide did not happen aboard the Queen Mary. The murder-suicide happened at the home of that family in, I, I think it was Bristol, England. Bristol, England. And so the man did kill his family. I don't know if he dismembered them, but he killed his family and then killed himself. And that happened at the same time that the family's, um, that happened at the same time that the family's grandmother was sailing on the Queen Mary. So she was on the Queen Mary at the time. She was in a second class cabin in the aft part of the ship. Um, I don't remember what the cabin name is anymore, but it was back here somewhere. And um, I think it was like literally one of the last like rooms somewhere over here. Yeah. Um, but yes, so the grandmother was sailing aboard the Queen Mary at the time, but she was not in, in that area at B340. She was at the aft end of the ship. And I don't even think she was on B deck. I think she was on main deck. So I don't know. But but the thing is, is that, that that story is retold so many times as a haunted story about the Queen Mary, and it didn't even happen on the Queen Mary. And, and the family members, you know, it was it was their grandmother who was on the ship. So, you know, it really isn't a story that I want people to walk away thinking was like had anything to do with the ship. So, um, what is in the third class cabins on D deck now? Um, okay. So nothing, basically there's, it's the easiest way to describe it is storage, but is it really storage? I mean, I don't know. It, you know, it, it's probably just junk 
but they call it storage. It's just the easiest way to say it. So when people tell you, oh, this area or that area is storage, it may not necessarily be storage. It just might just be empty space with a bunch of junk laying around. So, you know, that's pretty much what it is. They ripped it all out. And there are things on this deck that are still there that are not showing in this blueprint. Because this blueprint was fan-made, not made by the city. So, um, and we did talk about this on a previous episode of Queen Mary's Lost Places. We talked about um, about the third class areas, and we discussed what is in these areas. Um, so I would reference those live streams. And eventually I'll make much shorter videos that explain the same things that were taught to us in the live stream, and but they'll be made in a more better format for that is for more entertaining purposes um but for now that information can all be found in the queen mary's lost places series taylor says do you think that queen mary would have stayed in service a little longer if jets hadn't replaced ocean liners honestly um no i don't think so because even before jets replaced ocean liners there was still the threat of you know propeller powered airplanes because a lot of people were still using propeller powered airplanes and um and those you know were getting pretty big and you know so even if they hadn't you know made giant commercial jet liners they would have just continued making giant commercial propeller liners and so, um, so yeah, I think Queen Mary's days were numbered either way, just with the advent of air travel, honestly. Um, and then plus they were making faster and faster ocean liners. So there, there might have been an ocean liner that would have been faster than, um, than the United States, you know? Um, but the other thing that was going for the Queen Mary was that she was extremely expensive to operate. So remember what I said that Queen Elizabeth had less boilers, but they were larger and more fuel efficient? Well, Queen Elizabeth was always designed to be the cheaper of the two ships to operate. Queen Mary was was built with a disregard, I would, not a complete disregard, but mostly a disregard to um, to fuel efficiency and cheap operation. The reason why was because Queen Mary was designed to be the racehorse of the Cunard line. She was designed to win the Blue Ribbon. And so, you know, originally Cunard wanted to design a ship that was fuel efficient, but when the Mauritania lost the Blue Ribbon, and for years, other ocean line companies from foreign countries were winning the Blue Ribbon, there was a huge pressure put on Cunard saying, you know, the British cannot be embarrassed by not having a British ship be the fastest on the ocean. So Cunard decided, okay, well, we can't focus on fuel efficiency. We have to build a ship that can race for the ribbon. And so the Queen Mary was built with more boilers than was necessary to operate her. She was, she was built to guzzle fuel. And so, in, you know, granted, they did what they could to make her as fuel efficient as possible. So that's not to say they had a hundred percent disregard for that, but they they were more inclined to win the ribbon than they were to save money. And that was because of the, you know, the British people and the British government. So Queen Mary's days were always numbered. She was a fuel guzzler, even you know, even when she wasn't fully lighting all her boilers. And so um, Queen Elizabeth would have lasted longer, if anything, because Queen Elizabeth was slightly more fuel efficient and uh, she ran slightly cheaper than Queen Mary. But even then, the ships, the two ships were so large and designed in a certain way that it required a lot of crew. You know, Queen Mary's crew was 1,100 and same thing for Queen Elizabeth, 1,100. That's a lot of crew. You know, you look at like, a modern ship and if a modern if you look at a modern sh uh, passenger ship that has like the same capacity as queen mary they might have like a fraction of the crew they might have like one third of the crew that was on queen mary just to operate a modern cruise ship of the same capacity so you know it's um it's it, yeah it's quite quite crazy how much money she guzzled and so her days were numbered anyway uh
How big was RMS Queen Mary compared to SS United States? To be honest, SS United States is more comparable to Titanic. Uh, they had roughly the same dimensions. I mean, obviously, SS United States was slightly longer, slightly wider, um, but but Titanic had nine decks. SS United States had nine decks. Titanic was 882 feet. Um, United States was like 950 feet, um, just about. I forget the exact number. You know, so really, SS United States is more comparable to Titanic. So Queen Mary, and as you saw in the beginning of the episode, I I literally showed everybody the size of Queen Mary compared to to that. I don't have a size comparison of Queen Mary to SS United States, but I have a size comparison of, oh no, I do. Here we go. Okay. So the the liner at the bottom is SS United States. I know it doesn't look like there's much of a difference in length, but there really is. Um, you know, an SS United States, like I said, is more comparable to, to Titanic, but let's see, hold on. SS United States, no, that's, oh, it doesn't mention the length, but I know SS United States was like 950 feet long or something like that. So, you know, she was more comparable to Titanic, but for some reason in this image, they're showing them quite different in size. Maybe I should just look it up real quick. I am not a um, SS United States uh, knowledgeable person. <sighs> we'll just Wikipedia it real quick. Length 990 feet. Okay. All right. I can see that being a, a major difference. All right, so yeah, SS United States length overall is 990 feet, but Queen Mary's length overall is 1,019 feet. So she was literally 30 feet longer than SS United States. Um, and, you know, SS United States, I'm pretty sure she had, oh, it says she had 12 decks, but I don't believe that. I was counting them. Could someone who knows SS United States actually answer this for me? How many decks did SS United States have? Because I'm pretty sure she did not have 12 decks. <laughs> But then again, I'm not an SS United States expert. Uh, okay, so sorry, my my sinuses are getting clogged for some reason. What was in the pre-war first class playroom on Queen Mary? Post-war. Post-war on Queen Mary was a coffee shop. So the first class playroom that was on Queen Mary, let me get my deck plan. I don't have one from that specific period, but but I, I could show you. So, oh, that's the wrong one. Okay. So this shows it pre-war. There's a first-class children's playroom. But after the war, they moved the children's playroom to, I think it was over here where the music studio was, if I remember correctly. But anyway, they removed the children's playroom, and that became a coffee shop. And it became various, like, you know, merchandise slash coffee slash whatever for many many years and when the queen mary came to long beach uh it remained that way until i want to say the mid 90s when rms foundation or was it 2000s i forget whether it was rms foundation or queen mary foundation some somebody in the 90s or the early 2000s basically kind of sort of maybe ish rebuilt the children's playroom to what it looks like today but it's it looks nothing like it did in the 1930s i wish it i wish it still did honestly it was a beautiful room in the 1930s absolutely beautiful um i better end the live stream soon because we've been on here for like a long time what has it been an hour and 45 minutes wow okay 
Um, Taylor Lewis says, how much differently do you think Queen Mary would have looked if White Star had been dominant, had been the dominant company in the merger? I don't, if, if White Star had been the dominant company in the merger, I don't think she would have looked much different. Because if you think about it, she was already designed. By, by the year 1930, she was fully designed. So when the merger happened in 1933, yeah, 1933, um, it would have cost money to redesign her. So I honestly, Queen Mary would have looked the same. She would have looked the same. Because if you think about it, they would have cost money to redesign her. So, and I don't think they would have paid that money. They were both in, in dire straits. Uh, so the reason, so people are asking why, um, why the user Master Aquitania was put in timeout. I just have to mention it's because the, the user, the person, the viewer was, uh, was making a lot of comments that had nothing to do with the live stream, asking distracting things and bring and bringing politics into it. So that's why I had to do that because it's just, you know, I am not a person who disagrees with people on politics or whatever. I mean, I have my own opinions, but this is this live stream is about the Queen Mary. It's not about anything else. And so I don't like when people are trying to come in and create divisiveness over everything. You know, you can have your opinions, but this is not the right place to discuss that, you know? So um, that's why. And they're only on timeout. They're not banned from the channel. Um, what happened to the first and third class cinemas on Queen Mary? The third class cinema on Queen Mary is technically still there. It's not been, been changed, but it, you know, it's a multi-purpose room. So it's not, it wasn't always... Like it didn't look like a cinema in third class, but the first class cinema on Queen Mary was removed and uh, it's turned into kitchen space and such for the Chelsea Chowder House. So the, so basically I don't have it on deck plans, but this area here was the third, the first class cinema on Queen Mary post-war so this this deck plan is pre-war so that's why you see a ballroom and you see a starboard gallery but post-war this became the third class cinema or the first class cinema i'm sorry first class cinema and then when queen mary came to long beach all this was turned into um kitchen space for the chelsea chowder house and then there was a entrance way that was carved through the long gallery through the former ballroom and through the former cinema to get to the Chelsea Chowder House restaurant. So that's what it is today. What happened to the doctor's offices on Queen Mary's A and B decks? As far as I know, they are cabins today. Bowers of Wolf Lords. It's very fascinating how you remember all this stuff about Queen Mary. Yeah, you know, basically, you know, I... I... I fell in love with the Queen Mary January of 2020 and I spent a whole year after that researching the ship because I didn't want to make my first video about the Queen Mary until I felt I had enough knowledge to actually start opening my mouth and talking about her. So January of 2021, a whole year later I, I is when I started making my first videos about the Queen Mary. And you know, when I'm really, really interested in a subject, my mind absorbs the information like a sponge. If my mind doesn't absorb certain information, then the likely reason is because I just wasn't that interested. Um, but yeah, this is the reason why. So anyway, folks, I'm going to end the live stream because it's been an hour and 50 minutes, but I want to thank you all so much. This has been a Q&A. If you want to do more of these Q&As in the future, let me know. Leave a comment below saying that you want more of these Q&As so you can ask your questions and stuff. Um, and then next week on Saturday is going to be the rescheduled um, uh, Queen Mary Tech 101 the boilers and so that we're going to go into depth about how the boilers operate and what the boiler rooms looked like and everything it's gonna be really really cool very nerdy stuff for people who love ocean liners and technology uh, and then so we'll continue on with that series talking about the propulsion system and stuff for the queen mary but anyway folks thank you all for joining me and i will see you all next time Bye bye <laughs>